Uh, hello, everyone. So it's uh, 8 p.m. GMT, and uh, I would like to begin our regular webinar on vector symbolic architectures. And uh, today, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Paul Smolensky and Kuleman Halley uh, to give a talk on tensor product representation. So without any further delay, so I leave the floor to you. So please. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so let's give me one second here. I will uh, restart this presentation. Sorry, lost the lost my window here. That's curious. So okay. Had it all queued up to go, and then it disappeared. That's okay. People are still coming, so that's uh, okay. Good for them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so alrighty. So um, thank you very much, Evgeny, for the invitation. Uh, we're both delighted to be here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we will be talking about sparse scaling tensor product representations for large scale AI problems. Um, and uh, you might wonder why we are interested in tensor product representations. Um, primarily uh, it's because what we would really like is a vector space embedding scheme for arbitrary symbol structures over which recursive functions that we know to be important for cognition can be computed especially those for language in our case. Um, uh, so for example, two of these functions, which uh, if time permits, we'll get to by the end of the talk, um, are uh, function application or beta reduction in um, uh, crucial to compositional semantics and uh, tree adjoining, which is uh, fundamental to giving human syntax its level of complexity. So these are the kind of operations we want to be able to do uh, in a vector architecture. Um, and TPRs provide a way to do this. So uh, TPRs, uh, as do most of the uh, architectures you're all familiar with, they use a filler wall decomposition of symbol structures. Uh, the entities that make up the contents of the structure are the fillers. Uh, the positions in the symbolic structure of any given entity is its role, uh, to first approximation at least. Um, we embed these in separate vector spaces, fillers and roles, and combine them. Uh, the embedding spaces are real valued vector spaces. Uh, binding is done by the tensor product, unbinding by the inner product, um, and multiple bindings are bundled together to form representation of an entire structure by simple summation. Uh, well, <clears throat> sorry for interrupting you. Uh, I, um, do you yes. want to share something or because- What's that? I, I, do you want to share something or uh, you're just- uh, Oh, uh, oh my goodness. Okay, this, yes, 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 yes. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, let me find Zoom. Okay, share screen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's okay now. So you see the uh, brief review of tensor product representations. <clears throat> um, and um, uh, I will, you'll, you'll see the uh, two fu functions that I mentioned a moment ago, beta reduction and tree adjoining uh, at the end of the talk. Um, we will get error-free unbinding from TPRs if the role embeddings are linearly independent, uh, which of course requires that the dimension of the role vectors be greater than or equal to the number of roles in any given structure. 
Uh, so you can think about the uh, API for using TPRs as uh, a simple function for adding a binding by uh, taking the outer product of the filler in the roll and adding to the uh, accumulating tensor. Uh, unbinding is done by the dot product. Um, now, as some of you may be aware, TPRs uh, have a reputation for being impractically large, um, but they're not really as large as many people think. Uh, so for example, in the uh, algebraic mind, uh, Gary Marcus talks about a particular case of ternary trees uh, of depth five, 10 dimensional fillers and claims that you need 24 million units to use TPRs to represent these. Uh, but actually you need 7,280 units. Um, and uh, you see that the estimate there that's been published is uh, three orders of magnitude too large. Uh, and in fact, it can be done smaller if we use two dimensional roll vectors, which is all we need for binary trees. Uh, and then it's four dimension, uh, four um, orders of magnitude. Um, similarly, um, the uh, discussion of TPRs um, in Elias Smith uh, 2013 um, is off by six and a half orders of magnitude. The main reason for this discrepancy, I think, is that whereas in HRRs, uh, people typically represent a sequence like ABC as uh, A bound to B bound to C. Um, in TPRs, instead, we use uh, roll vectors for the different positions, and it's A bound to row one plus B bound to row two, and so on, uh, which is much smaller, especially as things get deep. <clears throat> and in fact, in many of the published papers uh, that um, use um, mostly uh, HRRs, um, typically claiming that TPRs aren't used because they're too big. Um, it turns out that if you look at the uh, size of the structures that are being used, um, the TPRs, which are the red bars, um, that would be give you lossless um, perfect reconstructability uh, <clears throat> uh, are quite a bit smaller than the models that uh, the dimension of the models actually use uh, with uh, HRRs. Um, however, um, <clears throat> there is a, an issue that we uh, fully admit to that needs to be addressed and I'll hand it off to Coleman uh, to take it from here. Thank you for that introduction, Paul. Um, let me attempt to share my screen. Can people see my screen? Yes. yes. Um, all right, so TPRs have lacked one major desideratum, um, and that would be, uh, we would like to have TPRs, at least as an option, maybe not in every case, that scale with the number of bound rules. Um, a lot of these alternative schemes do this um, naturally, um, but it's desirable that you may have a very large rule space, um, but yet your representation is based not on how large the size of the representation you need is based not on how large that role space is, but rather on how many um, bindings you have in a tree. So in any case where there's a sparse data structure, where there's many, many possible roles, but very few of them are bound, this is the type of case where this would be useful. Um, so uh, kind of our canonical example here that motivates that is that um, parses of natural language, particularly NLP parses, may include wide branching and deep recursion. Um, for example, this sentence um, from Pin Tree Bank, there's also speculation that Mr. Newhouse could bring in a powerhouse businessman or any other Newhouse family member to run the business side in combination with publish, and, you know, it keeps going on and recursing. I believe it has a recursive depth of like 29 or something like that. Um, this is what the tree looks like. And as you can see here, even just looking at the very first level, um, the tree on the right hand side, you know, it has depth 29 and um, is quite full. But then if you look at the left hand side, it's got like depth four and is then there's nothing, you know. So the potential role space here, if it's um, even if it's only binary branching, which there's at least um, four way branching here. Um, but even if it was binary branching, it's over 5 million roles, um, super large, undesirable. Yet um, the number of nodes in the tree is much smaller than the number of nodes in the complete tree. It's a sparse 
data structure. So this is exactly the type of situation. And of course, you know, as TPR people, we're very interested in natural language. So this is something we want to solve. Um, so more um, concrete numbers on this. Um, so in the mass corpus that we use in this um, work that will be discussed, um, the deepest tree has 29 levels of recursion and 98 airy branching um, at the maximum. Uh, and the so the complete tree here would be um, about 5.6 times 10 to the 57 nodes. So just absurdly massive. Um, if we wanted a role for each one, completely intractable or a, a dimin yeah, a unique independent, linearly independent role, this dimensionality is huge. However, 99% of the trees, which is in this case 35,379 trees, have less than 183 nodes. Um, we looked at 99, the 99 smallest to avoid tail effects. Um, but the largest ones were even still just like 300 nodes. You know, there were no trees with millions of nodes. That's not something you get in natural language sentences. Um, and it includes trees with um, tw recursion as deep as 29 levels and 98 area branching in this 99%. So that's really remarkable, right? You might have almost half of your nodes being taken up by one branching structure or many, many layers of recursion um, or any combination therein. So you don't really know which roles you're gonna need at a given time. You can't just say, oh, we'll pick a subset of the tree and call it good. Um, so that in the TPR status quo, um, we have it where we require linear independence um, for all the roles. So one possible tree position then equates to one dimension in the role space. This allows unbinding complete trees at max depth and max width without any noise, which is great. Um, but um, in an ideal world, we would only need, we would figure out a way where for a given tree, we get roles that are linearly independent only for the roles that are in that tree. Um, only the roles that are in the structure are what influence um, unbinding error. So, um, it would be nice to scale with that. So this is only 183 in mask. Um, so the question becomes, can we create roles for which we have a large set and we can select any of them at random and they will be nearly orthogonal with high probability? Um, if we can, then we'll be able to create representations that scale with the number of fillers rather than the size of the role space. Um, so the key to sparse scaling is um, random roll vectors. And the reason for this is that when roll vectors are orthogonal, we can unbind from a TBR using a dot product and just as the unbinding vector purely using the original vector, self-addressing unbinding. Um, and in high dimensions, just random vectors distributed across the unit sphere are approximately orthogonal. So, one might assume that at least to some degree, we would be able to unbind approximately using the dot product. Um, and here we can see um, the degree to which these random vectors are approximately orthogonal. So on the left, we have the percentage of the unit sphere in n dimensions um, that is um, within two and a half degrees of a 90 degree angle. Um, from the North Pole. So this is kind of like, if you pick a vector, what percentage is at a 90 degree angle from it? And very quickly, it becomes over 50%. Um, and by the time you're at 400 dimensions, it's at like 80%. By the time you're at 800 or 900 dimensions, it's already up to 90%. Um, on the right, we can see the actual empirical distribution. If you take 5,000 random vectors in R100, and we um, compute the dot products, uh, you get a normal distribution, I believe with standard deviation 0.1, and the standard deviation decreases the larger the dimension is, centered at zero. So you can see really, you're rare, very, very rarely getting dot products larger than 0.2, um, which may be good enough, um, close enough to zero for approximate unbinding. Um, so we can unbind approximately. Um, but this is going to introduce noise. 
But one thing that's always nice about TPRs is um, when you find noise, it turns out to be um, very well formed. Um, so the noise is exactly the sum of the dot product of the relevant role um, with the other roles in the TPR. Um, so this being, this is to say, if you take self-addressing unbinding and it's not exact, the roles are not orthogonal exactly, you get the true filler plus all the other fillers in the structure weighted by their dot product, um, the dot product of their role with the role that we're seeking to unbind. So we should find one, that these dot products are centered around zero, two, depending on the distribution of the fillers and the distribution of these dot products, um, this is likely to be destructive interference. So even when the terms are greater than zero, if they're facing in different directions, um, it, that will cancel out to some degree and you may still be able to extract close enough to the right vector if you have a filler vocabulary to identify what the correct filler was. Um, so the power of unproximate binding lies in the fact that if we're looking at the number of true orthogonal vectors, it's equal to the vector space dimension um, that we can get at one time that are mutually orthogonal. The number of approximately orthogonal vectors um, is much greater than the vector space dimension. And then the number of such sets of approximately mutually orthogonal vectors is even greater than that. Um, so first we took a look at um, just approximately orthogonal vectors, sort of setting aside the sparsity question. The question is, are our cancellation assumptions, are, are they good enough? Does this really work in just simple string-like context? Um, so we're sampling uniformly from the unit sphere in Rn and creating a lookup table mapping roles to role vectors. Um, so first we started with um, random TPRs. So here we have uniform um, on the unit sphere embeddings of fillers and roles, and the fillers are bound to roles totally randomly. So this is a lower bound on air because there are no particular co-occurrence statistics. There are, everything occurs with um, equal probability. So everything should be tending towards maximum destructive interference. Um, and here we find that if we use a role dimension of 200, um, we did this on many different role dimensions and found similar patterns, um, but we're able to get zero error um, pretty much at um, 200 bindings with a role dimension of 200. And we do not generally pass 1% until around 400 bindings with a role dimension of 200. So this is sounding very promising. Um, so we figured we needed to up the ante. And we decided to look at string embeddings of sentences. Um, so here, um, the first challenge we added was adding 300 dimensional word to vec Google News vectors for the fillers. So first off, the filler vocabulary is very large. There's 300 million, or not 300 million, 3 million Google News vectors. Um, and the sentences we used were of length less than 50. And we get both interfiller and interroll correlations for several reasons. First off, the nature of the Google News um, vectors, which are word to vec vectors, um, is based on co occurrence. So, you know, um, fillers that co occur in the same sentences are more likely to be similar. So, consequently, um, that's more likely to lead to constructive rather than destructive interference. Um, it's also possible that the roles to which um, fillers are bound are not, well, they aren't random. You know, for example, you're likely to find that um, words like the, a, an are much more likely to be bound in the first role of the sentence than the second role of the sentence. Um, so there are potential, um, the loss of randomness here is um, a potential for interference. Um, there's also constructive interference um, based on the Zipfian distribution of language. So um, it's the case that um, words that are more, words 
occur in a Zipfian distribution. So there are a few words that occur very frequently and many words are in the long tail. Consequently, if you're unbinding um, a word on that long tail, there's likely to be a larger amount of interference in the direction of common words, which will also have similar filler vectors like determiners, like um, pronouns, and consequently, um, that'll lead to constructive interference. And yet here, um, obviously we can't look at nearly as large of a role dimension. So we looked at role dimension 25 um, and we held it fixed in this case um, because we have a fixed number of size of sentences that we can actually look at. And um, we found error much less than 1% at when the role dimension is equal to the filler dimension. And we also found that um, you can get into the high 40s before passing 1% error in your unbindings. Um, as particularly if you look at top five word to vec vectors, because you know the similarity relations of word to vec vectors are such that um, it can always be difficult to grab top one. And if you look at the top five, they are semantically related typically, even in cases where there are errors. Um, so the summary of these experiments is that we found empirically actually approximately 50% smaller roles in TPRs than required by linear independence. That is to say that when we wanted to bind 400 things into one TPR, we only needed 200 dimensional roles. Um, so we found effectively twice as many approximately mutually orthogonal roles compared to the role di dimension. So this is a really good sign for the sparsity work that um, I will now get into. Um, so how can we exactly, can we use this approximate unbinding to achieve sparsity? The number of sets of approximately mutually orthogonal vectors is great, much greater than the vector space dimension. Um, so if role vectors for trees are uniformly distributed and independent, if we can achieve that, um, so like each position is independent from the others, the error of approximate unbinding should depend only on the magnitude of the sum of the dot products of the other roles in that specific TPR rather than the whole role space, right? According to the equation about the noise. Um, so this depends on two things, the number of bound roles in the TPR and the role dimension. The number of bound roles in the TPR um, determines the number of terms in this sum and the role dimension determines the distribution of the dot products, how um, much variance there is, how um, pointy it is at zero. And so by varying the role dimensions, um, we can mitigate the effect of the number of bound roles. Um, so this is for scaling, um, where we scale with the number of bound roles. So there's one issue compared to what we were doing before, which is our role space is intractable. We can't make every vector for it. So we can't create a lookup table for every role um, since the role space is exponential. So we need to introduce approximately uniform independent vectors that are produced from non-uniform, non-independent descriptions of roles. Um, so the solution that we came up with um, uh, came, uh, was helped by the fact that I took a cryptography class for some CS systems requirements. Um, cryptographic hash functions are really the right type of tool for this issue. So a cryptographic hash function takes a bit string, so a sequence of bits, and determinedly produce is a, a new sequence of bits called a hash, such that the hash for the hash, it is infeasible to find two input bit sequences that produce the same hash. Um, no way to alter, to understand that, oh, if I have one like this, I can manipulate it and get the same one. And that such that a small change to the input yields a large change in the output. It should never be the case um, that 
you can change just one or two bits and you get a change of one or two bits in the output. It should be extremely chaotic. Um, while that isn't necessarily guaranteed by randomness, the probability of that type of behavior is very high in true random cases, especially in high dimensions. Um, so the question is, is this random enough? And spoiler alert, it turns out to be. Um, and before we go on, uh, a note that these types of functions generally have fixed dimension and they always have fixed entropy. So you're only going to be able to get so much randomness out of any particular function. Um, it turns out in practice for everything we looked at, which are obviously quite large tensor product representations, um, you are still able to get sufficient entropy, but if you wanted to do something with many tens of thousands of bindings, you might run into some issues. However, um, variable length hash functions exist um, with a fixed entropy, but they're able to produce any amount of bits. It just will get less random with if you go beyond the entropy it has. So, um, We just used one of those, and now we're able to get um, kind of a gradual degradation if we were to go beyond that entropy. Um, so from this tool, we're now able to create cryptographic roles. Um, this um, is work that is presented um, along with the preceding experiments, but the meat of this paper at Coaling 2020 was this cryptographic role work. Um, so first we begin by labeling the role with a bit string indicating its position, any schema you want. Here we have the system we use, but as long as there's one bit string for every um, role that you might be looking at, um, that's all you need. Now, if you don't have to list out all the bit strings, you only need the ones that are in your specific structure and the bit strings are not individually exponentially large. So this is not a place where you suddenly get an exponential that we didn't take into account. Um, but now we need randomness. So this is where um, our cryptographic hash function comes in. So we use the shake 256 cryptographic hash and we generate three to the n pseudo random bytes. So our output size is three to the n where n is our um, desired role dimension. And um, three here is really a hyperparameter that got chosen just because one is too small. Um, you'll see um, what we're doing with the three in a second, but it's not really searched over. So it's not super important. Um, maybe two would work, maybe four would be better. Um, in any case, after this, we now need a vector rather than a sequence of bits. And obviously the sequence of bits is three times as long as we want. Um, so we take three byte chunks at a time and we divide them by the maximum value for three byte chunks or for a three byte sequence, largest three byte integer. So that will obtain random uniform samples on the interval zero to one. Um, so now we have in um, real numbers from zero to one positive um, uniform on an interval. Now, in order to get randomly distributed on the unit sphere, it, you need a normal distribution. Well, it turns out that by using something known as the box Muller transform, you're able to deterministically take two um, random samples on a uniform interval and produce two independent random samples through combining these original numbers that are normally distributed. And so now we have a random normal vector. And the only issue now is it may not be unit length. So then we just norm the length in the normal vector way. And now we have a random vector on the unit sphere that's calculated deterministically and independently for each position, allowing us to on the fly calculate um, 
what the vector for a position is, and it will be the same every time, um, but it should be pseudo randomly distributed on the unit sphere. Um, so now we've applied this to map to the mask corpus. Um, depth 29 with 98 um, uh, on the order of 10 to the 57 possible nodes in the complete tree. Um, but if we want to represent trees with up to n nodes, we ask what filler and roll dimensions do we need for 99% accuracy of unbinding the complete tree. Um, accuracy here is like an F1 metric where it's about um, what um, the precision and recall of the filler roll bindings are because you can have missing filler roll bindings or extra ones, but um, in any case, we kind of just compress it into an accuracy metric. And so this chart shows for um, various roll dimensions and filler dimensions, the max number of nodes in a tree reconstructed with 99% accuracy. And um, I'd say the takeaway here is this number, um, which says that with um, 200 dimensional rolls, 100 dimensional fillers yielding 20K units, we should be able to represent at least any natural language tree with up to 150 nodes um, with 99% accuracy. Um, but I said earlier that the dimension we need should depend only on the number of rolls bound. And it does in the sense that it doesn't have to do with the size of the trees that are possible. Yet, um, there's clearly a different constant factor here at play here than the previous experiments um, with the strings. Because there, we had a roll dimension less than the number of bound nodes that we were able to successfully reconstruct by a factor of two. And here, our roll dimension is somewhat smaller than, or our roll dimension is somewhat larger than the number of bound rolls that we're actually able to reconstruct. Um, so why is this the case? Um, shouldn't it be the same? Well, um, this was driving me crazy too. Turns out if you know which rolls are bound in advance, it is. So the discrepancies arise from the exponential nature of trees. Um, in that, when you make a mistake unbinding, say, a leaf node, you then are looking at noise of unbinding that's not random whether or not it's actually going to tell you that it's a leaf node, um, be an epsilon marked node to stop unbinding. Um, and consequently, if you make a mistake there, suddenly you've unbound an exponentially growing number of nodes and you have to hope it stops. Um, so this doesn't occur in the string case because for every time you mess up, it only introduces one new um, thing rather than two or three. So it's not exponential. And in fact, um, we gave a role oracle to our unbinding process. So it knew which roles were bound and which ones were leaves. Um, and in that case, we see behavior in line with the other experiments where we're able to get a role dimension about half the size of the number of bound roles. So that may be useful if you are able to know the shape of your trees generally, but not the contents, for instance. And also, you know, it explains that it's really not, has nothing to do with the distribution of cryptographic roles um, and everything to do with just the nature of unbinding from trees. Um, I found similar errors when you just used a lookup table on a smaller set of trees um, where it was tractable, um, you would find less good results even though we got good results with those exact same roles before. Um, and in fact, we also checked the actual distribution of cryptographic roles. We took the like first 5,000 nodes in a tree with um, quintiary, five airy branching. 
um, and um, took all their dot products and compared them to a distribution of 5,000 random vectors, um, dot products, and found, even though that's you know many, many thousands of dot products, it was indistinguishable up to significance um, as a distribution on basically completely randomly distributed. Um, so cryptographic roles have um, some pros for sure. I've certainly been gassing them up. Um, they're extremely general. They can apply to any schema where the roles form a language. And that is the roles are, can be described as a set of strings in any way. Um, you then just have to translate that string into a bit string and then run that through a hash function and any role schema you want, it can do. And they also solve sparsity, which is you know, not a trivial thing in this case. But um, one of our earlier reasons we said we were interested in TPRs in the first place is recursive structure that they have for symbolic computation, the ability to do these kinds of um, complex computation. And they, we've lost that. And we, they also don't really have any parameters that you could learn. Um, it's hard to see how you would integrate the cryptographic thing in a traditional backprop architecture. It would have to exist somewhere outside of that. So currently, we're trying to get these aspects back and use them to learn TPRs. So everything for the rest of the talk is unpublished, um, subjects to change potentially, although we're fairly confident in it. Um, and bleeding edge of TPRs. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, well, I say that, and now I present the classical version, um, which Paul has alluded to. Um, so to get recursive structure in classical TPRs, we have recursive tensor product binding to create the roles. I'm gonna focus on binary trees um, really for the remainder of the talk, just for simplicity's sake. Um, although we have it all worked out for, um, in airy trees as well. Um, so the original TPR idea, our role space has two vectors, RL and RR, excuse me. <laughs> and um, you bind a subtree to its rect respective position relative to the parent. Um, so if you had the left subtree L and right subtree R as TPRs, the TPR would be formed um, by just taking the tensor product with of L with RL and R with RR. Thus, any role of any given filler is of the form, say, left child of right child of left child of root, this kind of relative recursive role scheme. And we'll be keeping the relative and to some extent the recursion, but not the recursive tensor product aspect of this. So as you see here, we have a tensor product product here, you know, a big, a big O times. And um, we take the path from the filler to the root from left to right, and we tensor product them all together. And so we end up with two to the end dimensions. Um, and that gives us a totally lossless representation without sparse scaling, but it does give us a lot of symbolic power. So we can perform construction operations, cons, um, where we take two trees and make them subtrees of a root node, um, L and RL thing I showed before. We're also able to extract a subtree without recursing through the individual nodes. This is something that you um, need certain types of tree representations to be able to do. You know, if you had like a, say, a, your typical computer science node representation of a tree. Um, and you wanted to, for example, delete it, you'd have to recurse. Here we can extract, subtract, et cetera, um, without recursing through, um, simply by unbinding the role vector for the position we're interested in looking at. And that will get us the whole substructure, not just the top level. Um, Finally, um, we can do systematic transformations in a single step. Um, so what I mean here by systematic transformations is that transformations such that fillers and roles um, are transformed in the same way at every level. 
So an example of this would be taking sentences of a language where the word order is subject, verb, object, and turning it into a verb, subject, object language. So for example, in English, we have, which is subject, verb, object, we have Jesse thinks Kevin loves Logan. In a hypothetical um, VSO English, we have thinks Jesse loves Kevin Logan. So on each level, the roles transform um, independently. Um, so here we have a transformation in these trees of the fillers to their primed versions of the roles to a permutation. So R1 goes to R2, R2 goes to R1, and R3 stays put. And if we want to, both of these are um, linear transformations. So if we want to do them to our tensor product uh, representation, we can simply take this matrix product and due to the mixed product property of the tensor product, um, this, mat this matrix multiplication sort of distributes over the terms of the um, tensor products. So for our F applies to the fillers, R applies to the lowest level of roles and R applies to the highest level of roles. And if we had greater recursion depth, you just add more factors of R in there. So you can, learn these two matrix matrices say and immediately be able to form this type of transformation um, and we can also do more sim complicated symbolic manipulations as um, paul alluded to such as beta reduction and tree adjoining through composing these operations um, but you know no sparse scaling that's what we're here to talk about so we wanted to look at a new way to do this. Um, so we want recursive roles where recursion yields new pseudo random vectors at each step. Um, so we achieve this by letting the root role be a random vector in RM, um, call it V. And we select two random orthogonal transformations, um, EL and ER, it's um, actually there's a sampling algorithm. It's easy to um, get two random orthogonal matrices. And so to produce the embedding for the role um, with path PI from root to node, um, this would involve taking the matrix product from left to right of um, the root node um, what child position it is of the root node, what child position it is of the first child and so on and so forth. Um, and then at the rightmost position, we have this vector that if you're root, that's your role. Um, so it's recursive, but rather than being recursive application of tensor products, it's a recursive application of matrix products. This um, means that increasing depth will increase size. Um, and this combined with the random Nest property will produce sparsity. And it turns out that these various roles are approximately uniformly distributed, um, both in theory and in practice. Um, so here's the full expression for these new TPRs. Um, as you can see, the role term is as described. And then you just bind that to the filler. So there's only one tensor product. There's not any recursion of it. And um, so here's your evidence that you um, may use as you may, um, that this is in fact randomly distributed um, to an excellent approximation, these linear recursive roles. Um, so this is actually two graphs superimposed. The orange one that you can probably see is the distribution of random 5,000 or something random positions in the tree through this scheme um, with binary branching, um, taking the dot products of those 5,000, what's the average dot product? The um, blue graph behind that graph is taking the same thing. These are both in um, 150 dimensions, I believe. And um, doing that for just purely random vectors. 
So as you can see, they're incredibly well correlated, um, high degree of randomness to these representations. Um, so how can we do our traditional operations? Um, so to do construction, we take two subtrees, L and R, we embed them as subtrees of root. Um, one tricky thing is that now we've got the root on the left side. So rather than just simply tensor producting on the right, we have to use the mixed product property to distribute over, um, uh, to do nothing to the roles and multiply the fillers on the left. Um, so now we've const, and this mixed product comes up a lot because we want to operate at the root level pretty frequently. So I um, abbreviate that as mix role, um, and then the matrix we want to apply to the roles and the tensor product. And actually, probably forming this tensor product and doing matrix multiplication is not really the most efficient way. If you think of it in Einstein summation notation, you just need to sum over the role dimension and not do anything to the fillers. Um, essentially works the same way, but with less operations. Um, so then we want to extract unbind a subtree. Um, and so we have extract left and extract right. Um, so because our matrices are orthogonal transformations, um, they're transposed as their inverse. So if we just multi if we just do our mixed product thing um, to multiply the roles on the left by the transpose of the um, matrix for the child position we want to extract, um, say left, um, we the roles that have left is the leftmost factor, that left will cancel, that will no longer be there, they will be moved to root. Their roles will, if you start unbinding at root, the thing that was at the um, ELV position is now at the V position, which is root. Um, however, the roles in the right child of root will go to EL transpose ER, um, and then the rest of their role. And that's not gonna be close to anything, so if you start trying to unbind a tree structure, you're unlikely, you're as unlikely to encounter those as random noise. Um, however, it's not ideal um, because we don't have one dimension for every level of depth um, and every child position. It is necessarily the case that we can't have like separate subspaces for everything um, consistently. So they're going to still take up space and they can reemerge in construction. So if you multiplied this result by EL again, suddenly you would have the right subtree back in the right subtree position, which is pretty undesirable. However, clean because they won't appear when you're um, reconstructing the tree through unbinding positions, um, assuming you have large enough representations, um, you can just simply unbind. And as you're unbinding, um, start adding together a TPR of the cleaned bindings and you in ON time, where N is actually the size of the subtree, not the original tree, um, can extract a clean version of this. So as TPR people, we're not huge fans of cleanup, but it could be worse for sure. Um, so now as um, kind of a final treat, um, I have tree adjoining. I'm a, I think I still have time. I can't see the time, so. Um, um, well, it's uh, 10, to, uh, 10 to what, nine uh, GMT. So uh, maybe you, you have some 10 minutes, yes. Okay, to... perfect. Yeah, this shouldn't take more than that. Um, that sounds just about right. Awesome. So tree adjoining is um, the more complex of the two operations that um, of tree adjoining and beta reduction that we've implemented in this new linear recursive scheme. Um, it's the operation that gives tree adjoining grammars higher complexity than context-free grammars. That is a useful property for natural language syntax. 
it allows us to take a tree where um, there is a subtree headed by a node, say, A, and an auxiliary tree headed by that same node, A, and which has a sort of open slot in it called alpha. And it finds the position of the subtree called A, and it surrounds that with the auxiliary tree that's headed by A, putting that in the original place and putting the thing that was in that place in that alpha open slot. Um, that's very abstract. So here's a concrete example. So we have Kim hates symbols. And then we have really with an open slot. As we can see, we have a VP phrase here that's hate symbols. Um, so the tree adjoining operation takes in these two, this input tree and auxiliary tree. It finds the location of VP. It places really there and it places the VP that was there in the um, alpha position of the auxiliary tree, creating the sentence, Kim really hates symbols, <laughs> um, which I assume Kim is not here right now. <laughs> if not, she might not be enjoying herself. Um, so the, um, so here, I'm just gonna dive right in to how we're gonna do this with um, linear recursive roles. So first we wanna extract, what is it that's the non-terminal on the auxiliary tree that is what we're looking for in the initial tree. So here we just extract the root position by taking the inner product and we get the filler of the root. Um, very straightforward. Um, oh, I clicked one. Oh. Well, only one of those was supposed to show up. Um, the, this next one, um, RA, is the position of the tree um, headed by the symbol that's at the root of the auxiliary tree, in this case, A, in the original tree. So this finds the position of the red tree, A. And this next one, um, uh, uses the filler vector for alpha and um, unbinds it on the left um, to um, get the position of alpha in the auxiliary tree, AKA the site into which um, the red A will be inserted. Um, oh, that was supposed to appear one by one. That's unfortunate. Um, so the question is how to embed A under T. We're blocked by the root vector V. Um, so as you can see here, um, if we want to extend a roll to the right, so we want to say something's the left child of the right child of root, and then we have the left child of a new tree. And we wanna make that the left child of the, of the right child of the left child. So we're wanting to um, expand it to the right in this case, since we go from root to um, leaf. And this vector is blocking us. So our solution that we've come up with is to store a version of the TPR that hasn't been right multiplied by V for the purposes of this operation. And we're gonna call this being in mat space because the roles are shaped like matrices rather than vectors. And then for all other operations where we don't need to be able to append to the um, uh, second half of the roles, we'll project into what we call V space um, by simply right multiplying by V. Um, so now that we've got that, um, we make some slight adjustments here for roles that we're going to want to pin to the right side of. So this includes the site where A is at. So we use the mat, mat space version of the initial tree and the mat space version of the auxiliary tree for the position of the alpha. Then we can extract the subtree um, A and T by using the position of A and T, um, unbinding it from the mat, the mat space version of the original tree and cleaning that up by um, unbinding 
the elements of the tree. Now we have all the components we need, all the things we need to extract. We have A and then the sites for everything. And so now we can begin binding things back up together again. So here we want to retain all of T except the red A. So we take T, we subtract A prime tensor product T um, to, um, Sorry, that should be a prime, wait, a prime tensor product RA, I think. Um, and that will remove the red A. Then we use our operation to multiply on the left of the rolls to put um, A in the place, put the green A in the place of the red A. <laughs> um, by taking our RA sequence of matrix multiplications and putting it on the left of the roll. And now we remove alpha from its new location in A. So that's now at the position of the red A tree and then the times the position of alpha matrix multiplication times um, in the original green tree. And so we take that, we bind those two together, and we multiply it by V. Um, finally, we reposition A in T um, to be at that spot where alpha is. And now we have this tree on the right here. Um, I have some notes about beta reduction. It's sort of simpler, but I went through um, tree adjoining because I think it's clear why we need the uh, V space and mat space things here since it's all about trees. Thank you very much. I look forward to questions. Uh, thank you very much, Coleman and uh, Paul. So thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, so I definitely want to have a fresh look on uh, on the second half of your talk, especially this um, manipulations yeah. with the tree. Uh, extremely interesting. Um, and even though it's work in progress, it's uh, really cool. Uh, OK. Uh, uh, so questions from the audience, please unmute yourself. Hey, Haley, uh, it's Dennis speaking. Thanks a lot for the presentation. I was, I was wondering that that construction where you create uh, the, the iterative encoding of roles using matrices, uh, it, it resembles a little bit the, the VSA model called matrix binding of additive terms. Have you been, have you tried to sort of see like parallel lines between what you've proposed and, and this BAT model? Not personally. Um, Paul, do you have any thoughts? Um, I'm sort of less well versed in the um, VSA literature, um, haven't been around for very long and most of what I know about this area comes from my direct working with Paul. So um, it's cool, always cool to hear about connections. Um, do you have any thoughts? So, so um, <clears throat> is it the case that we're talking about um, repeated multiplications by matrices in order to uh, access more deeply embedded uh, exactly. or to create more deeply embedded things? Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that, that sounds quite um, closely related. So. Um, we will definitely uh, check that out and see what we can learn from it. Yeah, thank you for that. I just, yeah, just was, you know, looked a little mm -hmm. bit kind of similar and I was wondering whether, whether you had had the chance to like compare these two approaches. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Uh, can you tell me the name again? To make yeah, sure I, I will, I will, I, I can, I can send you a separate letter on that. Okay, thank yeah. you, Dennis. Yeah, no, okay. thank you. Just what, we were, just what we were hoping to find. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> More questions?
recommends? Yeah, hi, this is uh, this is Paxson. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I have a kind of uh, question along the same lines because um, there, th I think there is like a really direct uh, connection between um, what you're proposing with this kind of matrix binding and applying um, an orthogonal matrix iteratively <clears throat> to a random vector um, that comes up in the VSAs a lot. Um, and, and for instance, um, um, we have some papers about sequence memory and um, sort of the, the, the most basic VSA way of encoding a sequence is, is to use um, a permutation uh, operation on a vector, right? And so like you pick a random vector to start and then you just apply a permutation over and over and over um, iteratively just to indicate uh, the different positions in the sequence. <clears throat> and of course, you know, I mean, the permutation operation is just equivalent to multiplication with a permutation matrix, right? And that's just a different, you know, orthogonal matrix. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, I'm, yeah, so, but it seems to me that like, um, you know, you guys are kind of combining some, some ideas and VSAs um, for the, you know, with uh, your, your uh, Tensor product um, representations and uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, we uh, definitely will need to look at the use of uh, recursive matrix multiplication, whether it be permutation or not, um, uh, to see again what kinds of uh, use those could be put to, to to compute the kind of functions we're interested in computing. <clears throat> and maybe uh, people already have done um, important parts of that that we can build on. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, any more questions? So I see something in the chat. Uh, any link to those VSA approaches mentioned would be appreciated here. Um, Dennis, I guess, and uh, uh, Pax, and so you, um, probably the uh, VSA main, mailing list would be an appropriate channel to, to post such links. Or maybe uh, right away, Dennis, you can put uh, um, a link to HD computing website. Yeah, yeah I, I can I can write a separate letter maybe to to the Google group on that. Yeah, but uh, I just uh, I think and, it, and uh, it's good to, to the mention website, the, yeah. about the website even in the chat so that uh, yeah yeah sure or not and on link, the list. Link to the website. Uh, to the website is easy to send. Yeah, yeah uh, so uh, and they, uh, so I'm using this moment to draw your, I mean, to draw the attention of the audience to this website, which uh, has a comprehensive uh, list of uh, literature. So it, it reflects the recent uh, findings in the area of VSA, TPR, and such. Um, yeah, uh, any more questions, comments, please? <laughs> Yeah, I had a question. Am I? Can you hear me? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. About the um, the cryptographic role vectors. Mm -hmm. That that was an interesting approach. But one. So my question there is. So one of the things that that I liked about sort of the that the vector binding was that similar things would end up with similar you know similar structures end up with similar representations, and it sounded like the way you were generating the role vectors there was that you, you you wanted to get separation so you were talking about how a, how it it basically moved things apart so so things that that were similar became you know basically orthogonal and i was wondering what the implications of that are for the for the sort of resulting similarity of similar structures that might differ in that they have a similar but not identical role or you know how, yeah. how do you see that working out yeah i mean you're you're absolutely correct and that's um one of the reasons we wanted to um kind of um build on the um approach 
of cryptographic roles to the linear recursive one, because in order to get the generality that cryptographic roles provide for representing anything, it sort of becomes necessary that you avoid this type of similarity so that it works out of the box and that type of thing. Um, and of course, the goal was just trying to reconstruct as much as possible where similarity is your enemy, really. Um, hmm. But I agree that, yes, it's pushing things to be orthogonal. And if you want similar roles to have similar representations, it's not going to do it for you. Um, there are ways to get around that with the linear recursive ones. If you have matrices that are um, maybe not quite exactly right and maybe push things one way or another, um, we haven't really investigated that in any particular detail, but that is one appeal. Um, but I think um, I, from a conversation I had with Paul recently about this exact topic in preparation for this talk, and maybe he'd have more to say, is um, kind of, uh, yeah, it's not really our focus, this um, idea of specifically role similarity, because it's sort of not necessarily like definitely the case, right, that that makes sense, you know. Um, in some ways, a role might be similar, but also need should have a totally separate representation because it's an opposite thing, right? Um, that you might not mix up. Um, and so I guess, you know, because our focus is on function computation rather than say, um, dot product getting together our representations and seeing they're similar, um, that's something we've given up. I, for the most part. Um, in let let me say something that. about that. So yeah. um, the, <clears throat> the, the objective of the um, linear recursive role uh, approach is to make it natural to embed um, this ability to do recursion uh, inside some kind of uh, deep learning neural net, which would be learning these matrices uh, rather than being given them. So now, now we're not talking about the cryptographic context, we're talking about the other context uh, where we have these um, <clears throat> matrices for uh, moving the vector that encodes one role down to the vector that encodes one of its children's roles. Um, so I, I look at it that you have a sort of pure symbolic world where as Coleman was saying, similarity plays no role. You can even think of it as your enemy if you want, but uh, where, uh, the different positions in the tree are just different positions. They don't have any similarity. The important thing is that they're different. Um, that's the purely symbolic uh, end. Um, and then on the opposite side, of course, we have distributed representations for roles, which have a uh, very interesting and, and important role, uh, similarity structure to them. Um, and we're trying to put these together so that uh, a, a deep learning system could learn the extent to which the role vectors uh, ought to be uh, given some interesting similarity structure uh, versus ought to be allowed to be as independent of one another as they are in the symbolic limit. Um, so uh, this uh, is sort of one end of that picture and this engineering of similarity of role vectors is the other end and we're looking for a way to work in the middle so that the right degree of independence and similarity can be found uh, for given tasks um, through deep learning. Does that make sense, Tony? Sure, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the explanation. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Well, well, following up on what, what you said, is it is it like foreseen application as of now you, using using this kind of encodings together with, uh, with, with deep nets or have you already started doing so? We are very, that's like the exact frontier we're on right now. So we're like in meetings, working on architectures. Um, a lot of this is already implemented in like PyTorch and stuff in those types of ways. And we've got thoughts through parts of it, but the architecture is not fully worked out. So that's where we're at. So I understand so, so that it's, oh, sorry. Yeah. So we can implement the computation for doing tree adjoining, verify that it actually works which it's yes. supposed to, uh, but now we're trying to just determine what kind of learning architectures are appropriate to try to embed this in and what kind of tasks uh, will we ask for it to learn what kind of uh, symbolic 
approximately symbolic functions. Sorry to cut yeah. you off, Dennis. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I was yeah, I was just exactly curious. Like, I understand it's unpublished work. I was exactly curious about what kind of tasks one one can do it because I, yeah, like would it be something like trying trying to learn something like a grammar, or where would trees be useful? Yes, so um, I look at it like this: that in natural language processing, uh, a huge amount of progress has resulted from replacing symbols for words with vectors for words and vectors for other uh, kinds of constituents. Um, so that the distributed representations there have a lot of power clearly for all for every aspect of natural language processing, I think it's pretty much safe to say. Um, and so what I'm uh, hypothesizing is that it's not just the fillers where this is true, it's also the roles where this is true. Uh, mm -hmm. That if we uh, start allowing the uh, distributed representations of roles um, to do their work uh, in capturing uh, aspects of language, which uh, on the, in good old fashioned AI couldn't be captured because the structures were had to be discrete and in uh, more vanilla neural networks uh, can't be captured because there isn't really encoding of structure at all. Um, that's, that's what we're interested in. And so problems uh, in language processing where uh, discrete structures have uh, run into the wall because they're just not flexible enough uh, is what we're uh, trying to address. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Thanks, Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, could I pop in at that point? Well, uh, along those lines, I mean, um, but I mean, isn't the challenge really, um, you know, like inferring the parse tree rather than, you know, like just representing I mean, because like, yeah, I mean, it'd be easy to represent the tree, um, but, you know, if you just give, if someone just says a sentence, it's not a trivial thing to just go from the, you know, sequence of words to the parse tree. There's a lot of, like, implicit, of, you know, inference that you do all the time. And so, like, how, what do you envision in, in that domain? I mean, is deep learning really the right tool to, like, learn, you know, just learn the parse tree or, or what do you think? I think so. I think... Deep learning is the right tool to allow a network which can build trees to learn how to build the right ones in order to uh, perform the NLP tasks where trees are needed um, or where trees have been uh, very useful. Um, so uh, learning how to parse, but also learning how to invent the, own, the, the right kind of structures to parse into uh, is what uh, is the ultimate potential here, I think. But I, I guess, I mean, would you expect to learn the grammar or would you expect to like mostly, I mean, just build that in, right? That, I mean, there are, you know, it's not, it's not always just like a, a learning issue, right? Because, um, you know, well, there, there's just like naturally structures in the grammar that you would, you know, rules that you learn there's rules that like yeah i mean how would you learn those rules you just plan to learn it from data and, um... well i mean um another dimension to this kind of integration um is for us to be able to take the knowledge that we have from grammatic grammar theory um and inform learning networks uh, of the information that we have gotten through uh, decades or centuries of an linguistic analysis. So we would like to be able to inject um, biases which could inform uh, the search of the deep learning uh, system uh, for the kinds of rules that we know uh, tend to be uh, useful in language uh, and uh, perhaps even to the kind of role structures that we know are useful in language. So uh, rather than taking a, the, the traditional discrete implementation of these things and building them in, what we're asking is the question, can a network, uh, when it's given biases to use these structure building tools uh, in, an, in a way that we already know is helpful for language, uh, given those kind of biases, will it in learn to invent the kind of structures that allow us to do even better on tasks than we can do uh, without those structures. Um, and maybe in the process, we'll learn something about linguistics by looking at the kinds of structures that end up getting invented. 
Uh, so we give biases, but we don't, uh, these are, you know, a weak, uh, they're, they're soft constraints. They're not uh, hard uh, requirements that certain rules or rule types be used. Um, uh, so I see Ross has his hand up. Yes, Ross, please. Hi, yeah, um, I'm presuming I'm visible and audible. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to jump back slightly in the topics to the conversation that uh, Paul and Tony had about roles and uh, role similarity. And I think it's, it's, it's really interesting that if you look at classical AI and symbolic computing, roles are treated as atomic symbols. They're just a thing. It's, they've got no internal structure. But if you're looking at, uh, in, in VSA, it's particularly clear that you know, an arbitrarily complex structure is still just represented by a vector. So there's this sort of ambiguity that you know, the, the system really doesn't know whether when it's presented with some vector, whether it represents something atomic or something deeply composite. So you do have, with, with role filler bindings, there's nothing to stop the role itself being a composite uh, compositional structure. So you could think, for example, in a robotic application, the role might be some sensory motor program which delivers the value of the, the filler. I, I do these things in the world and this value gets returned by the world as, as the filler associated with that role. So in that kind of a, uh, uh, an environment, it makes then sense to think of uh, similarity between roles, mm -hmm. but it's, it's more structural similarity rather than the, the straight sort of literal similarity, which tends to be what pops out in um, uh, you know, the classic embeddings that are used these days. And there's no question there, sorry, I just, it's just because I've, I've very rarely mm -hmm. heard it discussed of the, the, the concept of a role being something other than an atomic symbol. Well, I think that in, it's, it's um, up to the analyst to some degree to decide what to call roles in a given uh, computational system. Uh, and I think that uh, there are cases where traditional symbolic approaches have things that deserve to be called roles, which are not atomic, but yeah. their internal structure is discrete. Um, mm. And so uh, they, um, <clears throat> could potentially benefit from being replaced by the kind of distributed continuous uh, formalization of a structured role that we're trying to uh, develop here. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I would so like one... to... Oh, go ahead. Uh, and my comment concerns uh, uh, determinism in, in classical computing and non-determinism in computing at vectors. One of the things that engineers are now actually be beginning to be interested in, in hardware that would be useful for computing with vectors. And one of the things that interests them is that the components of the vectors do not have to be deterministic. This, uh, the, the representation is very redundant, which means that you don't need you don't need hundred uh, percent proof components. Now, I my understanding of crypto cryptography is that there you really assume for the cryptography the work you, you need to have deterministic computation. So, so there may be some. Um, some conflict with these, these two ideas. I don't know if you have, if you have any opinion about that. Just, just de determinism and yeah. um, and and cryptography. So that's that's sort of my right. comment, my question. Yeah, I, there is a tension, certainly. I think um, with uh, the whole. Um, you, in the case that we're considering you need enough determinism to get close to the um, right role vector whenever you want to come up with a role vector. But you're right that maybe there would be a way that doesn't involve cryptography that's not so deterministic. On the other hand, 
there is um, actually in some ways a greater degree of non-determinism in some parts of this than previous TPR work um, where we're um, actually relying on and using the fact that the unbindings aren't exact, right? So we do get some noise every time we unbind, but because they are highly redundant, um, they're um, uh, close enough. And so you both are kind of there in the same thing, <laughs> I guess. Thank you. Thanks. So I wait for some. Yeah. So I, I had just yeah. one one yeah, kind of some. one kind of fuzzy fuzzy question, which if you don't have an answer, it's totally fine. Um, but so as long the, as you accept the fuzzy answer, I totally. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> along the way. <laughs> so transformer networks have have you know had amazing success over the last few years, and yeah, you know, when when I look at, at what they're doing, you know, you can see the the embeddings for words, and I can sort of if sort of if I squint, I can can imagine sort of correlates of binding and unbinding and and dot products in some of the operations inside, but there's no real clear correlate of roles in in there. Um, that I can see, you know, do you, do you have any observations around that, around, you know, to do to, to transform a network show that we don't really need to, to have the, you know, roles and binding at all, or, or what do you, any, any observations there? Well, <clears throat> I think that um, transformers um, are evidence uh, that Compositional structure is very powerful in neural networks, just like it is elsewhere. And so, um, what transformers do, the way I think about it, is that the attention uh, mechanism of transformers um, establishes a kind of graph structure within the network uh, of who's who is attending to whom. And that graph structure is not fixed or anything, it is a function of the input. Um, uh, so, it's dynamically created graphic structure, um, but um, there are, um, and graphs are of course a, a powerful kind of uh, compositional structure. And I think transformers benefit from that fact. Um, uh, there's also the fact that um, when uh, a cell in the transformer issues a query and you look at the dot products between the query and the keys of the other uh, cells uh, that it's attending over, um, uh, in some sense, what you're doing really is sort of unbinding that, that, that query vector um, and seeing what re is returned. Um, in fact, you can formalize the processing as a kind of tensor product representation combined with uh, inner product uh, um, querying, um, uh, which is very exact up to one thing, which is that the uh, transformer uses a softmax function to take all of the dot products that a query generates um, uh, and to make them all add up to one, which is not the kind of linear operations that we do uh, when we unbind from TPRs usually. Uh, but aside from that, um, you can think of, of, of the, this, the set of um, values on a, in a layer um, as a set of fillers, uh, each of which is bound to its key by the outer product. Um, and then you unbind with a query, uh, pulling out uh, the value vectors, which then get summed together in the way that you would get. If you view the, the uh, tensor representing a, a layer as the sum of all of the uh, bindings with the va value vectors to their keys. Um, uh, so I think that, it's uh, useful to think about trans uh, transformers as doing role binding and unbinding. Um, and, and the math is you know, um, relatively uh, good match with a few exceptions uh, here and there. But um, <clears throat> does that make sense, Tony? Yeah, yeah, that's actually pretty close to the, to the way that I was looking at it. That the, the, the role, I like the matrices for the query and, 
the query and key and value matrices. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. So I think the, the success of Transformers should be very encouraging to all of us uh, in this group. Uh, <clears throat> All right. Uh, listen, it's uh, I really love this discussion. So I hope we have even more questions. So this is uh, way the longest uh, discussion we have so far, and still twenty six people are online, which is really great. Uh, um, yeah, especially in the part of the world where it's already past past midnight. <laughs> right. um, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, any more questions? Please unmute yourself. So we, ha we have uh, some time for a few more questions. Well, let me count to 10. Uh, I would like to say something. It's yeah, not a question, sure. though. Um, <clears throat> I just want to thank everybody for uh, attending and giving us this very useful feedback. Um, uh, there's a lot that we can learn from the kind of work that people in the audience are doing that we still need to learn. Um, and uh, we're grateful for the uh, input that we get from you um, and from the work that you've done. So um, just wanted to express appreciation for that and um, look forward to continued discussion. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, well, thank you very much. Just some statistics at the top of attendance, we have had uh, 32 participants, which is very uh, good. Uh, so thank you very much, Paul, for uh, today's talk and Coleman as well. So uh, really great, uh, uh, you know, thing, uh, things to think about. Uh, uh, for the audience, I would like to uh, remind you that I still have some slots to fill uh, with the presentation. So if you want to uh, present, uh, present something, please drop me a line. Uh, I also see some new names uh, in the list of attend uh, uh, attendees. So uh, if you want to be on the mailing list, uh, so also please drop me a line uh, or uh, just uh, send me a request uh, uh, via uh, Google, uh, Google Groups. Uh, well, uh, let me see what... Yes, uh, Ross sends uh, thanks to everyone. Um, okay, thank you very much, everybody. So I see you next time in two weeks. Uh, by, by the way, Paul and Coleman, uh, this might be also of interest to you because the, uh, the next talk will be also about TPR. Yes, so, I, saw that. Uh, I hope to see you all uh, in two weeks' time. So uh, have a productive week. Thanks very much, Evgeny, for creating this, in, creating this environment and inviting us into it. Cool. Nice. Okay, see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.